been meaning to do this for a couple of weeks. These elderberries are now ready to be harvested. I kind of do this in a pretty simple way. I basically just bring out a plastic bag and some shears and I clip them off into the bag. You can see that some of these berries are actually starting to get in pretty bad shape. I should have done this a week or so ago, but we've had so much rain. But they are still usable because I'm going to make a jam out of these. And all I really need to do is to clip them off into a bag and I'll be done. This is basically what I do. Don't forget not to eat raw elderberries they do connect, contain small traces of cyanide i need 500 grams of berries to make elderberry jam all right so i've got all the berries collected the next thing you're going to do is you're going to take a large bowl and you want to weigh it you need to know what that bowl weighs empty let me actually reset this it don't okay that's zeroed so it says 6.2 ounces that is something you're going to need to know might be better off to actually know it in grams 177 grams because you need to have 500 grams of berries that means that when i weigh this out it should weigh 677 grams for each recipe that i'm going to make I see that I brought in a bug. I ain't too worried about it, but he ain't going to last here very long as soon as my cat sees him. Anyways, so to separate these, there's multiple ways you can do this. Some people take a like kitchen fork and run the branches in between the fork tines so that the berries fall into the bowl. I've seen some people... Just do it with their fingers. Your fingers are going to be probably discolored. But um, just do it whichever way you can. But you got to remove the berries from the stems. That's the next step. A fork has always worked for me in the past. You're probably going to lose berries on the floor. So make sure you have a clean surface. This is basically the way I do it. Think of it like you're stripping the berries off in between the tines, but it actually works pretty good. It takes a little bit to kind of like figure out what you're doing. Um, the other thing is too, I should mention, I always wait and harvest the berries when they're bit, pretty much at the end of their life cycle. So I think that that makes the juice sweeter. I could be wrong about that. Um, a lot of people will just take and grab them with their fingers. These actually aren't leaving too much because they are starting to get pretty close to being dried. So I'll probably just use my fingers. If these were maybe a week or two sooner, they would probably be still pretty juicy. Again, I'm getting these when they're at the end of their life cycle. I think that makes everything sweeter when it comes to these. And we will still go through a stage where we have to strain and try to get rid of some more of the stems. But this always works pretty well. This takes a whole lot of time. I'm not going to make you watch all of it. I'm just going to do this first stem or two. And then I'll bring you back when I get done. You can see that it will start to discolor your fingers though. They are starting to turn somewhat purple. So you may want to actually use the fork method, which doesn't have that problem. But I'm not too worried about it. I ain't got anywhere to be this week. I can go around looking like a smurf. This is really kind of the hardest part about harvesting these.
I know some people that will like put them in water and use like a potato masher and just kind of like jam it around a few times. They seem to have good luck with that, but I don't really have good luck that way. So I just prefer to do it like this. If you are doing these and they're wild, you need to definitely make sure that it's elderberry and not pokeberry. Pokeberry will kill you. <laughs> Elderberry will too if you eat too much of it raw. Keep that in mind. Once you cook it down though, that releases the toxins. That's the whole reason why we're doing that. Sometimes I find it easier if the stems are really big like this one. Is as I'm pulling the berries off to actually, you saw me probably break off a stem. It just makes it so I'm not you know, getting bugged by all kinds of other stems getting in my way. So like this one, once I get all the berries off of it, I'll take and pull this whole stem off. Usually I do smaller stems. I don't know why I picked like the biggest stem on there. A couple of random berries on there yet. Let me go ahead and get those. And then I freed up and made it easier to get to these other ones. Anyways, I'll bring you back when I have this bag done. It's going to be a while. Alright, that's kind of what you end up with. Both hands. One obviously not as bad as the other, but still bad. And I'm going to go ahead and weigh this now. So we'll go ahead and turn this on. We was at 177 grams. And now we are at 1283. So that means I've got enough. You need 500 grams minus 170 or 1283, 1284 minus 177. That's going to give us about what? 1100. It takes 500 grams per uh, batch. So I'm going to make two batches. And the next thing you're going to do, you're going to. Um, you want to take and pick out as many of the larger stems that you see. Now, I don't get too particular about it. In all honesty, you know, obviously anything that's bugs or anything like that, I'll get out. Any large stems, I'll get out. But I don't honestly, like, sweat over it, if that makes sense. And I would say a lot of country folks is like that. Now, city folks might be a little bit different story. I don't worry too much about it. Ain't going to be any worse than anything else that you're going to get in a store where, you know, you open up a can of something and there's bugs in it. Next thing you're going to need, you're going to need a big pan. For every serving of this or every batch, you need 400 grams of sugar. So if I got a thousand grams of berries, that means I need 800 grams of sugar. I'm going to put these berries in a big pan that has enough room for the sugar. Also going to need one tablespoon of lemon juice for each batch. So I'm going to need two tablespoons of lemon juice. I'm going to use a potato masher to break the berries up that aren't already broke up. And then I'm going to bring all that sugar, berries, and lemon juice to a slow simmer until it all gets constituted together so let me get set up to do that i'll bring you right back so i've got my elderberries now in a pan i've removed as many of the stems as i could i have my because i'm making a double batch i have my 800 grams of sugar i need to get my two tablespoons of lemon juice but i'll go ahead and put the sugar in now then I'll need my two tablespoons of lemon juice. Usually when I am cooking recipes, I prefer to use bottled lemon juice. I do grow my own lemons. And that seems not that great to do. 
to use store-bought lemon juice, but there's something about the acidity of this bottled lemon that's not in the lemons that I grow that makes it better to use this way. Once you have that done, you use a potato masher to mash the berries some to release some of the juice. They don't all have to be mashed, but you want some of it to be mashed. I usually run it through a couple of times when everything looks like it's turning good and purple. I call it good. When most of the sugar is mostly now purple instead of white, that's usually about when I'm good with stopping. You can see we are getting close to there now. Can you see that? I have no idea what you can see. So most of the sugar is now purple. Now you're going to turn this on a low heat. And let it simmer for about 20 minutes while stirring it often. So usually what I do is I get this up to temperature. When I start to see steam coming off of it, I set my stopwatch for about 20 minutes and you just have to keep stirring it during that time. If you have a candy thermometer, any temperature 180 degrees or slightly above kills off all the toxins. So what you want to do, you have to keep stirring this because that sugar will actually burn to the pan if you don't. But you want to put a candy thermometer in there, get the temperature up slightly above 180 degrees and hold it there for 20 minutes. Now the, the sugar will start to break down and try to boil on you. Um, and that's a pretty good indication that you're pretty close to the correct temperature. But I'll bring you back when we get there. Not sure if you can see this now, but the berries just started boiling. And if you look that I'm at just about, oh, 212 or so degrees. Now's when you want to set your timer for 20 minutes and keep stirring this. Don't stop stirring until that timer goes off. I have the timer on my stopwatch set for about 30 some seconds now. And I'm basically just going to stir this for 20 minutes. I'm not going to make you watch me stir it all the time, but literally don't stop. The minute you stop, what's going to happen is it's probably going to bubble over. Just like making, if you've ever made any other jellies or jams where the temperature's got to be really high and there's a lot of sugar, once that sugar starts boiling, it kind of gets to be unstable. So just keep stirring it. Don't let it boil over. If it is going to boil over, it's better off to just lift the whole pan up off of the heat. But keep that temperature up there for 20 minutes. I'll bring you back after that 20 minutes is up. I'm about 17 in minutes in right now. And one thing I forgot to tell you, if you've ever made jelly and jam before, um, there's a set test that you're going to do. And there's two ways to do it. I forgot to mention this at the beginning, but the two easiest ways that I know of is to either put a plate in the freezer before you start this. I'm sorry I didn't mention it before. Or put a metal spoon in the freezer before you start this. You could go ahead and do it now. It's probably not going to be accurate, um, but I always keep a plate in the freezer this time of year because I'm always making jellies and jams from the fruit trees, from, you know, back in the spring. I just leave a plate in the freezer year-round. So what's going to happen is, when our 20 minutes is up, we're going to look at the what we have the temperature set on on the stove, which I'm on about a level 4. We're going to shut the stove off, and we're going to take a spoon of this liquid and place it either on our metal spoon that's in the freezer or the metal plate, and then we're going to transfer that plate or the spoon into the refrigerator. And we're going to wait about, oh, three minutes or so, three to five minutes. And we're going to go check the consistency of the liquid that's on there. 
If the liquid is skinned over and gelled up, just like you're making any other jelly or jam, then it's probably okay to go ahead and bottle this. If it's not gelled up or skinned over, then you either want to boil it longer at the same temperature you was boiling it at, or you want to add about a half a cup of sugar and go about five more minutes and test it again. So I'm going to show you how to do that when we get there. Let me see how much time we got. You can also see what will happen if I don't. So it's 19 minutes right now. I'm going to show you what's going to happen if you don't keep stirring this. You'll see that this will very quickly start to rise up. It's not right now because the burner is actually off. But as soon as that burner kicks on, it's going to very quickly rise up. You can kind of see the little dimple there on the pan. Not only that, it's also getting thicker just by the nature that some of the stuff's evaporated. But earlier on, I could have showed this to you. It will get up crazy and start to rise. I think now most of the water's evaporated out of it. And it's not maybe going to do it. Eh, maybe it is going to do it. Either way, you kind of get what I'm saying. I hope. That's why it's so important that you keep stirring it. Because it'll very quickly get out of hand. It'll boil over. It'll create a mess like you'd never believe. So, I'm actually showing 19 seconds and some change. I'm going to shut the oven off. I'm probably also going to move the pan slightly off the burner. Just so it's not getting as much heat. And then I'm going to get a spoon and show you how to do this uh, test. So here's the spoon. I'm going to take some of the liquid. I'm going to go over to my freezer. Excuse the mess. I'll probably end up getting a lot of this out. Open up my freezer. There's my plate. I'm putting the liquid on my plate. Now I'm going to transfer the spoon and the plate into my refrigerator. As soon as I make sure I got enough space. And I'm going to wait about five minutes and check on it. So I'll bring it back then. All right, so the five minutes is up. What I'm actually looking for is you don't see it dripping off of there. It's kind of thick, but it's not really skinned up too well let me actually stick my tongue on it right, it's got to go a little bit longer you actually see if I just I stuck the whole spoon in my mouth and pulled it out and there's still some on it You can actually see where I just drug my tongue across it. It's still got to go just a little bit longer. So I'm going to go about five more minutes. Stick this back over here. I'm going to reuse the same spoon and stuff. So it's, I need to pull this off after, you know, in about five minutes, but put it back on the stove. Keep stirring it just like you was. Give it five more minutes. Do the test again. And when it gels up, then it's ready to be put in mason jars and the lids put on it. And the mason jars will self-seal. You don't even have to do it in a canner or anything. So I'll bring you back then. All right. On the skin test, you see there's liquid in there. And when I turn it, it doesn't run out. That's exactly how you know that it's ready to be jarred. Every time I get to check it, I get to taste it again. All right, so what I do is make sure all your jars are clean and dry. Make sure your bands and lids are clean and dry. Make sure your funnel's clean and dry. And you're basically just going to ladle this into the jars just as it is. Depending on how much you make depends on how many jars you're going to require. You definitely want to do this while the liquid is hot because as it cools down is what actually seals the lids. I think I might have enough for three pints. Might only be two pints. We'll know when we get there. 
I usually go just slightly above the bottom of that. Then I move it to the next jar. I put the lid and band on it. Just want to put them on there snug. You also want to make sure that there's no jelly on the sealing surface. I just did. I used my finger. This is hard to do one handed. I'm going to go ahead and fill these up and bring you back. All right, so the final step is you need to label and put the date on these jars. I wanted to show you something though. So this made two and a half jars. And some people are going to be like, well, what do you do if you didn't fill the jar all the way up? That one immediately goes in the refrigerator and that's the first one you're going to eat. These other two, they'll seal on their own over time. And uh, they'll last for a long time. But this one here needs to go in the refrigerator right away. I'm going to do that now. And uh, that's pretty much how you make elderberry jelly or jam. That's how you make most jams. The difference with, is with elderberries is they obviously have toxins in them. So you need to get, get the temperature up. You can't eat raw elderberries or at least not a lot uh, before it's going to make you deathly ill. So uh, always make sure that you bring the temperature of elderberries up above 180. I went to 215 because I know that's a good temperature to make jelly. And that's how I do it. So anyways, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this. God bless you. God bless your families. And God bless your homesteads.